Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Entenaire, and in today's episode, Ben and I are joined by whitetail hunting legend, John Eberhardt. We discuss catching world-class steelhead salmon in Michigan, having over 50 deer in the Pope and Young record book, all while hunting on knock-on-door permission or public land, how he never has to worry about his scent or wind direction, how he started saddle hunting over three decades ago, and finally, we gave him some hunting scenarios and asked how he'd tackle them. Please welcome John Eberhardt. All right, everyone. Like I just mentioned in the intro, we are live with Mr. John Eberhardt. Sir, how are we doing today? Josh, I am doing absolutely wonderful. <laughs> hey, thank, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. And then, of course, like always, the man behind the switches and cameras, Mr. Ben Johnson. Yes, I'm oh, here. Ben, I can't He's see excited. You, but hi, Ben. <clears throat> and ben is very excited for this. So, Ben, uh, you know, we'll get into this, John, but Ben was an early adopter of the Eberhardt saddle this year. Mm-hmm. Oh. He tried it. He didn't. He wasn't quite comfortable. Maybe you can teach him how to use it properly, uh, especially when you come down into the event that we got going on, which we'll talk about more for our listeners. But just to let you know, he did try to. He did give it a whirl this year, and uh, maybe needs some yep. John Eberhart uh, teachings. So yeah, it was, it was last season, but yeah. it was uh, more or less a novice, you know, yeah. novice user on my end because I'm not used to saddle. I mean, I I just started hunting yeah. deer, so it was more or less. Uh, an issue on my end, I guarantee it. Oh, for sure. So we'll we'll dive into that some more and maybe get some tips, and especially when you come down. But uh, before we get too far into the weeds here, John, let's go ahead and introduce yourself and kind of give the listeners a little bit background story of who you are and uh, why we'd want to have you on the podcast today. Okay. First off, Ben, I will definitely walk you through that. And uh, I, I get that occasionally from people. They'll send me emails, and I always tell them, hey, with your saddle, with your ESS in hand, you know, give me a call. I'll walk you through it. Um, so that that's that's actually pretty common because two panels require a little bit more work, but they're way better in the long run for hunting the rest of your life because they're more comfortable and personal. Okay, my name's John Eberhard. I've been bow hunting for 55 years, somewhere in there. Um, yep. I've got 52 bucks, record class bucks, uh, 32 in Michigan, and the rest are out of state, 20 from out of state. Um the out-of-state places I've hunted have been Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, and Missouri. I think it's pronounced okay. Missouri. And um, everything I do is on either public land, free walk-on property, or knock on doors for free permission property. So I've never hunted over food plots, don't hunt over bait, um, never paid a dime to hunt any place in my life. I don't have any relatives that own any property. Uh and I just learned through hard knocks. Nobody in my family hunted, so I just could have done everything on my own. And as I mentioned to you before, I'm not really a follower. I just go about my business and try to learn and, and do what I feel yeah. is best, like what we talked yeah. about when we, in our earlier conversation yeah. about getting into saddle. Sure, sure. And there's definitely some tactics and and things that you've shared with people. Obviously, you have your own YouTube channel yourself that's very educational. You've been on several different podcasts from – wired to hunt to trail camera radio, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the list probably goes on for a long time. Well, I mean, let me, let I, me elaborate on that if you will. <laughs> yeah. I've written three books, uh, three bow hunting books, bow hunting pressured whitetails has been the number one bow hunting book ever printed. Uh, and they're all instructional books. I have the Eberhard outdoors, which is a YouTube channel. Uh, I have a four instructional DVD set and there's no kills on them. It's all instructional stuff. Sure. Uh, been on over 50 podcasts. I've written hundreds of articles for national and regional magazines. Um, I do whitetail workshops in the spring for those. I do them in the spring because that's when I do all my postseason scouting and tree prep, and that's when I want other people to do it as well. Yep. And I think that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess the term legend has been thrown out there quite a bit when it comes to your name. I know Greg says it a lot. Mark says it a lot. Do you, I know you, you humble yourself a little bit, but how do you, you know, looking back and seeing everything that you've accomplished just from doing things your way, not being anyone else, not apologizing for, you know, being you. I mean, yeah. how does that feel looking back and seeing all the, you know, there's probably thousands and thousands of hunters that you've been able to inspire or help in some different way or, you know, or form. Like how does looking back, how does that make you feel? 
Uh, it's very gratifying. And my dad was a janitor, and I had lots of weird jobs, so uh, didn't come from money by any stretch of the means. I never, ever thought when I got into deer hunting that I would end up in this spotlight, if you will. But I love helping other hunters be more successful. Hunters put so much time and so much effort and so much money into trying to kill and make themselves the best that they can be, and I try to shorten that learning curve. I have a lot of people out there that beat me up, especially on scent control, and I just don't allow it. I don't allow yeah. anybody to beat me up because it's usually somebody that wants things that are easy. They're not detail-oriented enough to do things correctly, and I, if you allow people to taint your judgment and quit offering other people help. Um, I don't know. I'm just not that type of yeah. guy. And I actually yeah. was, believe it or not, when minutes before you called me on this podcast right now, I was on a Facebook page because somebody sent me an email um, and they were thinking of getting out of putting stuff on Facebook to help other hunters because they were getting beat up so much. And I still have to go back and reply after this because you can't allow other people's ignorance to influence what you're doing to help other people. Because there's a lot more people that yeah. like what you're saying and use it to shorten their learning curve than there are people, you know, the one or two or ten people that are beating you up all the time. They're just ignorant yeah. people that are just lazy or else they're just fat people sitting in their soiled underwear replying <laughs> on Facebook. It never exactly. hunted a day in their life. <laughs> no, you're always going to have a troll somewhere. And, you yeah. know, I, you've definitely, like I said, you've definitely inspired a lot of people. I mean, you knew, you've helped Ben and I personally, I mean, without even knowing each other. And so um, we're super excited to have you on. And we're super, super excited to have you down here and really pick your brain some more. I mean, there's a lot of respected hunters that I, I even look out at outside of you that have been influenced indirectly or directly by you as well. And so... It's all this big circle, and I think it's important for people to realize, too, we talk about it all the time, but the hunting community as a general community is so beat up with outside influence from other places, whether it's, you know, pro-animal groups or whatever have you, PETA, you know, name, name pick your pick your organization anymore pick these days. Point. And so I think, yeah, so it's it's not really helpful to anyone for us to be, beat ourselves up about what people are doing. If someone finds a particular way that's good for them, then... Godspeed, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, it, it's not, it's, <laughs> there's no reason to, to, I guess, troll anyone anymore these days. But with all that said, I, I do want to give people a little bit of background because I know you rep for Berkeley as well as some other fishing companies before. We kind of talked about this a little bit before we got started, but I know you have a, a world record steelhead as well as I maybe some other species. Had, 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 had a record. Record. Okay. So let's dive into fishing. Ben is my uh, resident angler here. And so I know he's going to be super excited. We did watch the video with you on, I think, what was they called it? Whitetail cribs, if you will. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so with, with the Exodus guys. And so I saw all your rods and I know you made some custom rods, but let's dive into some of your fishing background just a little bit and kind of give people a bigger picture of who you are. Yep. Well, my dad did fish, so I, I was brought up fishing. Um, he didn't bass fish. He just fished general in general. And I don't rep Berkeley now. I repped Berkeley okay. back before Pure Fish. Because Berkeley was sold to Jarden and then Jarden sold it off and made it into Pure Fish. So um, I have always fished a big time steelhead fisherman. <clears throat> I started steelhead fishing in the 70s. And in 1983, I caught a line class, four pound test line class world record, which was 18 pounds, two ounces. And when I say line class, you can't take four-pound Maxima or four-pound Trilene, XL, or Stren and enter it as a line class record because it has to test out at 4.6 pounds or lower to be a four-pound line class record. And if you take four-pound Trilene or Maxima, it tests out seven to eight pounds. So basically, it'd be like using two-pound test, you know, Trilene. Yeah. Uh, but I, I pike fish. I make my own lures. I built custom steelhead rods in the 70s. Back when light lining, you know, everybody was using two and four pound tests back then. It was a big, big deal. Um, so the rods were like anywhere it's from 10 and a half to 13 feet long, uh, you know, to have that buggy whip effect with that lighter line. Yeah. And I bass fish, I pike fish, I caught probably, a, I live on a lake, caught 
over a dozen 40 plus inch northern pike on lures that I make top water in the summer. That's and awesome. I walleye, I fish for all species. Yeah. Waiting for the if bluegill a, to get on their beds, actually. <laughs> there you go. If you had a particular uh, species that you favor, what was one? What's one in particular that you think that you favor? Steelhead, without steelhead. Doubt. Steelhead is definitely the most difficult to hook and land. Sure. And we have, and Ben and I have kind of talked about this. I, I want to get up there at some point, but going up to the Cleveland area, the Northeast Ohio area, they have a lot of ste- steelhead runs. I, that's really only where I know about it here in Ohio, but they look like a really fun species. The one I've never chased. So, you know, we're typically doing panfish or, you know, maybe the trip up to Lake Erie to catch some walleye or some perch or something like that. But uh, I know Ben loves, he was just up your way, actually. He was crushing some smallies at St. Clair. Yep. Oh, so okay. we had a good trip up yeah, there. That, that was a great clip. You, you, uh, or a great trip, I should say. You broke what PB what three times? Uh, there for a while, every fish I caught was a new personal bre- best. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. it, it was awesome. It, yeah. I, you know, something I'll remember forever because it, you know, it was still cold, and uh, the first day I got really sick because there were, you know, Choppy. like three foot waves coming off the main lake, and oh, that's um, tough. I was trying to film, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that makes the videos here. So I'm trying to film our, um, one of our fishing buyers. And, um, I was looking at the camera and just those yeah. rollers coming in. I just, it just got me. It was bad. But, uh, the next day we went out and it was amazing. We caught over 40 giant smallmouth, yeah. And, uh, like I said, I broke my PB every, every fish for at least four or five fish in a row. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah. And if you, uh, <laughs> For those listeners that are listening, we have this video. It's a whole vlog style video on our um, YouTube page. So definitely head over there and check out that St. Clair video that you guys can see them crush some mm-hmm. huge smallmouth. So, so you know, John, that's, um, what, that's one thing. If I don't, if you don't mind me interrupting, that's one thing about Michigan. Michigan sucks at whitetail. Okay, we have yeah. we're probably the worst <laughs> state in the country as far as big whitetail. But when it comes to fishing. Michigan yeah. has the yeah. best fishery for probably steelhead, for salmon, for smallies. Uh, it, uh, yeah. must, you know, we have our yeah. fishery is phenomenal. Yeah, you Traverse Bay, East, East Bay, up in Traverse City, and Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, you can't beat those lakes for small. No, mm-hmm. no. And actually, I'm glad you said the musky fishing too, because Jason, our uh, pro staff, Jason Plant, uh, mm-hmm. he had he was on episode I want to say four or five. I'd have to go back and look, but yeah. he uh, he's a big time musky fisher, uh, fisherman, and so he. Uh, we gave all sorts of tips and tricks on that, but he was just like, you know, Ohio, you can catch them here, but you know, an extra two hour drive, you're in Michigan, make the drive. Yeah, it's make well the drive. worth the trip. So the only, the only downside of the musky fishing in Michigan, because the true musky fisherman is one of those guys that, you know, casts with bait, so they're physically mm-hmm. hands on, and you know, it's usually a thousand casts per hit. You can go out on Lake St. Clair on a decent day, and you can have yep. ten hookups trolling in one morning, like with mm-hmm. musky. Yeah, and he's done a little bit of both. He's uh, he what the one we were talking about was fifty plus. All he said what fifty two inch. I want to say yeah, it was like fifty three, yeah. fifty four inch. It yeah. was up in Canada though, I believe the yeah. one that he caught that was that big. Yeah, so that was a whole that was a whole great episode. So if you're listening and you're interested in musky fishing or any type of like predatory fish fishing, if you will, definitely head back and check that one out. One thing I, I did want to lighten the mood. I mean, not that you're a, a, a yeah, stern guy by any means, but Ben hasn't seen this yet. And I told him I wasn't going to tell him about it until we started talking. The Whitetail Cribs video, I got to give the listeners a quick synopsis of the three little bucks that you had mounted in your basement. And there's a particular funny mount right next to them. So if you want to give people the story of the uh, the bucks and maybe that pheasant that you may or may not ran over. Uh- <laughs> Yeah, I met my wife on the only blind date I've ever been on in my life. And when I walked into her apartment, there was three deer heads on the wall. I mean, what are the odds of that happening? Yeah. Uh, her first marriage, she was married to a guy, and they owned some really, really, really good land. And she got into deer hunting. And uh, one thing I will say, be careful what you wish for, because yep. for the first five years we were together, I got her into bow hunting. And she shot a buck every year. You know, they were all year and a half old bucks that she was shooting. But it totally took me out of my game, you know, because we hunted at totally different levels. But I had to take her when I went. So yeah. I had to set her in her tree and prep her tree. So there was a five-year period there where I didn't kill squat as far as mature bucks. I, I actually gave up on the concept of trying to kill a big buck while I was hunting with her. <laughs> so be careful. 
careful what you wish. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a really funny story. And then you had the pheasant. I know she wanted to have a she wanted to have a pheasant mount. And this one about had me in tears when you were telling those guys about the how you you're not a bird hunter. So how do we right. uh, get this pheasant down? <laughs> I absolutely suck with a shotgun, and I have no interest in killing a pheasant. So she wanted a pheasant <laughs> mounted in the basement because we've got other stuff down there. And yeah. my son Chris and I were driving down. <laughs> I think this is probably illegal, but what the hell? We're driving down this <laughs> road, and a pheasant ran across the road, and I hit it. But when I hit it, all I did was I broke its wing. And yeah. so this pheasant ran into the fence row. This was on a back dirt road. Ran into the fence row, and it couldn't fly away. And Chris and I literally chased this freaking pheasant up and down this fence row because the crops were all picked, okay? So it didn't have yeah. corn beans to go in off of the side. It was bare dirt. And it just run up through the security cover of this fence row, and finally we ended up tackling it and <laughs> killing, killing it and <laughs> put it on my wall. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. So don't be confused when you see that in any videos. He is not the, the upland bird man. He is just the, the man of opportunity. There you go. <laughs> Chris, there wasn't right. assist with Chris. Chris definitely had an assist. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, let's go ahead and let's get into hunting. That's what you're here for, and that's what we want to talk about, specifically saddle hunting. Mm-hmm. This has been something that you're doing. I know we mentioned the word legendary, <laughs> um, but in terms of saddle hunting, you truly are probably the one of the most legendary, most iconic persons when it comes to hanging in a tree with a saddle. Um, you've been doing it since before Ben and I were even born. So that by itself is, is something super impressive and we'll get into that. But I think the other important thing, and you had mentioned it earlier is that you're doing this and you have 50 plus deer, Pope and young deer, um, you know, some of Michigan, a lot of Michigan, a lot of out of state, all, all public land, all knock on door access. So let's give you a second just to go ahead and let's talk about saddle hunting and, and how you've transitioned that over the last, you know, 30 plus years. And then obviously all while just staying on public land. Yep. Well, 46 of those 52 book bucks were taken from a saddle. Some, you know, the other ones were either taken off the ground and two of them were actually with a gun. So out of 52, two were with a muzzle order. And I don't know. I just, I used to hunt out of, I'd nail a two by four or a two by six into a crotch of a tree. That's how I started out hunting when I started hunting from trees. When I first started hunting, you couldn't bow on out of the tree. You had to hunt on the ground. When I did, I started just using two by sixes and crotches of trees because tree stands were all steel back then. They were really creaky. They had a lot of joints. Um, they were heavy. They were extremely cumbersome. Climbers were death traps. The old Baker yeah. climber stand, if you were on a smooth bark poplar or maple or a beech tree, they were definitely yeah. noted for sliding down the tree with you on it. So they were very unsafe. So. I opted to use, uh, you know, I opted to use a two by six in a crotch, and then in 1981, I saw this plastic bag full of what looked like seatbelt material hanging in a yeah. store. It was in Jay's Sporting Goods, and um, I looked at the thing. Nobody knew what it was. I didn't know anybody that hunted out of a saddle. It was called the Anderson Tree Sling at the time. And, but I looked at the packaging and it showed a guy moving around the tree 360. This thing weighed two pounds. Uh, I could prep as many trees as I want, hunt out of every tree I ever hunted with this one saddle for the rest of my life. I'm still using a modified version of that, which is yeah. basically that two panel ESS. And, um, I don't know. I, it was very awkward at first. And I'm always the type of guy that I look forward. I don't look at instant. I don't look at what's right in front of me today. Okay, this isn't comfortable today, so I'm going to not use it for the rest of my life. No, I look at it as the advantages it's going to give me for the future of my life when I'm hunting. And if I see yeah. that it's going to give me a lot of advantages, I'm going to modify this and make this thing work to take advantages of what it offers. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, it had a fixed lead strap. So once you were tethered to the tree, there was no adjustability on it. But I used screw-in steps, and you could move around the tree, 360. You couldn't fall out of it. Once you're hooked up, you couldn't fall out of it. It did not have a safety rope or a lineman rope like they do now. It was just a tree yeah. tether. And I just never looked back. I I would never 
I would never, ever even consider using a hang on or a climber. Yeah. Yeah. No. And we had kind of talked about that before too, but I think I'm in that same boat. I think that first few hunts, you know, I, I practice in the yard just to kind of get my feet wet, but those first few hunts, it's just like, maybe after the second or third time, second or third day, I was like, there, there's, there's no other option for me. Maybe if I have to take somebody with me and we're doing a, like a father son hunt or a father daughter hunt, maybe, but there's no other way. The benefits far, I mean, there, what, yeah. what downside is there? I mean, truly what downside is there that you just don't get to climb up and you're ready to go? I mean, but you kind of do, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, that's not even really a downside either. I mean, um, and I know, you know, it's been going this year, Ben and I going, I mean, it made it easier for us to, to film each other because we were able, we right. didn't have to be so specific about where we were hunting. Um, we you know we did a media day with one of our pro staffers, Andrew, who's a big ESS fan. That's the only way he hunts out of is a two panel. And we did some uh, content with him this uh, November, private or uh, public land in Columbus area. It's highly pressured. You guys would, when, we, when you come to our event here in August, you guys will hit it off for sure because he, uh, he took full advantage of that. And in, even when we were doing our media day, I was able to hang out of an eight inch tree. You know, yep. it was the only one that gave me the angle that I needed to use to photograph him. And you wouldn't have been able to do that with anything else. And so that's, yeah. uh, there, to me, there is no downside truly. I mean, everything's got its place. You know, Greg and Ernie will tell you from tethered that it's a tool just like anything else, but it's a tool that I, it's that 10 millimeter socket that I'm always going for. You know, it's that one that's always, it's always the tool that I'm reaching for. Well, it, back in my day, it was half inch and nine sixteenth socket. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's where, where it's that one. There, where is it when I need to find it, right? Yeah, and, and uh, what you said a minute ago is so true. You you're hunting out of an eight inch tree. The the trees yeah. that you can hunt out of a saddle just open yeah. up pretty much every tree. I don't care what kind of lean it's got. I don't care how big yeah. it is. I don't care how small it is. I've I've shot deer out of four inch diameter trees. I wasn't up yeah. the tree very high, you know, cedar tree, sure. but you know, 12 feet up, but, uh, yeah. yeah, there's no tree, almost no trees. You cannot hunt with a saddle and yeah. you can't say that with anything made out of metal. No. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, especially when you're hunting public land like yourself and like Ben and I are doing too, I don't have the luxury of cutting every branch down on my way up, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So, you know, I have my, I have my lineman's belt and I have my tether, you know, you're, you're doing the one over, okay, clip the other one. And I just, I can work up those limbs like no problem. Like it, I mean, heck you can even use the limbs as a step, you know, cause you're yeah, always connected cool. to it. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it was a game changer. Ben and I were able to hunt, uh, this year in some, uh, state preserve land that I had, uh, for two weeks, uh, mm -hmm. you know, draw system here, uh, just random raffle drawing. And, uh, we were able to find trees right next to each other and, and talk and, I don't know if we could do that. And we especially couldn't have hiked them in for the mile that we did. So, <laughs> you know, that was, uh, it was a big difference, but. Yeah. That's another biggie, the weight and how cumbersome they are. If you're hunting yeah. public lands, you're typically going through junk because that's yep. where the big bucks are. They're in the junk, they're in the security cover. And you just can't yep. do that with, with heavy and cumbersome framed stands. Mm -hmm. Not to mention you're just dragging, you're hitting every bramble or briar on oh, your way through. You're and, swearing yeah. by the time you go 100 yards through yeah. the jump. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, when we'll get, we're definitely going to get into the scent stuff. I know Ben's got some questions for you too in the hunting world. Um, but before we get too far off of the saddle side of things, um, I kind of want to give the listeners. So in August 27th, Saturday, August 27th, we're hosting a teach and train event with Tethered. You can find that on our Facebook page as well as Tethered's Facebook page. Uh, John, yourself, is coming down yep. um, as one of our uh, Tethered reps along with Shannon, our, our actual rep. Um, I believe Jared Schaefer is going to be here for that one as well as some other Tethered people. We're looking at maybe getting Taylor Chamberlain, who you guys heard on this podcast as well. Not to, not to poke fun too much at Taylor, but he's also the one that kind of got me in the saddle hunting as well because I figured if that guy could hang in a tree that's eight inches, I certainly can. So shout <laughs> yeah, out to he's a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Taylor if he hears this. Um, but uh, you're coming down for that. So I kind of want to give the listeners, we've talked to Tethered, we've talked to Adrian and, and Taylor, and people at this point know who Tethered is, but how did your connection with them and your relationship and the start of the ESS and your relationship with Greg, how did all that transpire? Well, there was a talk forum and it was called saddle, saddle hunter talk forum. And yeah. Greg and Ernie were both on that for years. I really didn't know who they were. 
you know, because they sure. you have your little trade name or whatever it is on your site. And yeah. uh, you know, I posted a lot of stuff. I tried to help people on there because it was a it was obviously devoted to saddle hunters. And new tribe, you know, trophy line came out in the early two thousands, and yep. then it went defunct, not due to the saddle part, due to something totally different. And then this company out west called New Tribe. They made saddles for recreational tree climbers. Out west, okay. that is actually an activity. Right. People climb okay. trees. So, you know, people reached, saddle hunters reached out to New Tribe to get them to make something for saddle hunting that didn't have all these metal buckles and metal parts touching each other so that they didn't make noise. So New Tribe made several saddles. And then Greg and Ernie kind of got together, and they started Tethered. And okay. Ernie, I think Ernie was making platforms out of old tree stands and stuff and selling them on, on yeah, metal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, basically, they reached out to me. Uh, Greg always called me the godfather of saddle hunting. I'm the one. Yeah, hey, still no, does. I've got, a, I've got a chapter in every one of my three books on saddle hunting. So that's how much devoted I have been to it. Yep. And yep. Uh, so they reached out to me and uh, wanted to do that two-panel ESS. So we did that. Had to make some modifications to it to make it uh, insurable, if you will. Yep. And well, God, we've just really never looked back. I've been on their pro staff now pretty much since their inception. The inception yeah, from their inception. And I know I think I've seen you... I think there was a video that they had posted. Maybe it was on Greg's channel or it could have been on Tethered's channel. But uh, you guys were hanging out. I think they were coming up to hunt and kind of yeah. showing you some new product. Um, I think at that time, I think they were bringing you the Menace, maybe. It was, the uh, there, was it the Menace? There was, yeah. there was another cloth. You know, the, you know, the Menace is, is sewn in. The cupping and everything is sewn in with the, the paneling. But there was another one that had uh, some perforated. It wasn't. Maybe it was the Predator. The Predator? No, that's the platform. The I'm trying to platform. think of the other... I'm trying to think of the other saddle they brought, but um, regardless, he, neither here nor there. But I know it, they had shown you that, and there was a little bit of you that may have thought that he was going to switch over to a panel system, like a normal seat system. Is there? What's your particular reason for gravitating towards the ESS and staying with that two panel as opposed to getting like a Phantom that people are familiar with now, or maybe even the Menace? The Phantom and it's all single panel saddles. Well, it's Menace they don't yeah. even make anymore because it's very uncomfortable yep. but all single panel saddles tend to climb so when you're sitting in them and you're fidgeting around your butt cheeks are moving or when you're walking okay. your butt cheeks are moving up and down whenever you move in the, in your stand and that yeah. saddle moves up on your waist maybe a 64th of an inch every time you do that and after a while as that's climbing up your back it pulls it out from under your butt so you have to yeah. lift your weight up and pull it back underneath and with a DSS, it's two separate panels. So you got a panel that's under your butt, under your butt cheeks, and then you got a panel that you can move wherever you want. It. You can put it at your waist, you can put it up in the middle of your back. You can overlap them to be a six inch seat or just slightly overlap yeah. them, have a nine or 12 inch seat. So the outer panel, which you have above your butt, if that moves a little bit, it doesn't affect your inner panel because that stays under your butt 100% of the time. So it never, ever works up. Also, with all single panel saddles, you have a two inch strap around the top of the saddle seat and you have a two inch strap at the bottom of the saddle seat. Yep. So when you're sitting in a saddle, especially on a long term hunt, like an all day sit, that two inch strap that's basically tucked under your butt cheeks becomes a stress point because that's a weight bearing strap. The yeah. upper strap doesn't really do that much because it's up above, almost to your waist, if sure. not like yeah. the above your waist. So it doesn't have much support. Whereas with the two panel saddle, you have four two inch straps. So you've got eight inches of straps. And typically when I'm hunting out of my ESS, I have the panels slightly overlapped. So basically they're, touching each other or slightly overlap. So I've got eight inches of support straps totally underneath my butt. You know, they're not up at my waist level. All both panels yeah. are down in my butt. So it's a lot more comfortable on a long-term sit. So you have, it's more comfortable because it's eight inches of straps as opposed to a two-inch strap at the bottom. And it's versatile. 
You can adjust that outer panel. You can put it into a recliner. You can do it however you want. So it's just a lot more versatile. And the D-rings, aluminum D-rings, a lot of people, yeah. well, I don't like metal on it. Well, the D-rings should never, ever touch each other and make noise. Yeah, those yeah, D-rings, no. whenever you move the panels, those D-rings are smooth. And it automatically, your your bridge, which is connected to those D-rings, automatically slides and recenters your weight distribution in the saddle. Yeah. You don't have to move them. Because with the single panel saddles, all single panel saddles, they have fabric bridge loops. So yeah. you have a fabric bridge loop, and you either have a fabric bridge or a rope bridge, am steel or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. as soon as you put your weight in it, it binds, and it stays in yeah. that position. You physically have to maneuver that bridge on those bridge straps to get it to the point where it's comfortable. With the yeah. ESS, it automatically slides into that position. You don't have to ever touch it. Yeah, and I can definitely echo what you're saying there because I know even the differences between the um, the original Phantom saddle and then going to the Phantom 2, and, of course, they've made the changes since then, and I've kind of migrated with those guys. I think I can I can definitely f- for, you know, visualize kind of the pinch points or kind of the issues that I have when I'm sitting 8, 9, 10 hours a day in that. And so it's, I'm glad that you pointed that out because I think, and I think I've heard you say this before and it's definitely important to realize too, but there's this market for people. Ultimately we want people to saddle hunt. I mean, if you're a single panel or a double panel, ultimately I think the, the main messages in this is that it's clearly an advantage, whatever saddle you're using. But, and I've heard you say this before too, you know, there's a comfort, if you will, or a safety or a reassurance of having something that completely covers my backside, right? Especially, right. I mean, that's one of the main reasons I also like having the back strap, you know, as far as some, some lumbar support or some shoulder support back there. I think as people progress, maybe they start to get more comfortable in the tree. They realize that this is a lot safer than what they maybe realized off the beginning. And now they're maybe wanting to invest in something or tweak. And, you know, you know, a saddle hunter to me is like a guy that likes to tweak things. I'm looking at one right here across the table from me. He's Mr. Tweaker himself. But yeah. as you start to get more comfortable with this, that's when maybe you're looking at the two panel system and you kind of figure out which one actually works best for you. That is one of the cool things about the two panel is you can adjust it. So if you're a newbie, you can make that seat as deep as you'd like to be more comfortable, to feel safer. And nobody's ever yeah. fell off the saddle. Saddles are way safer oh, yeah. than any tree. Uh, yeah. But then as you become more comfortable and more proficient using a saddle, you will almost 100%, I will guarantee, you're going to shallow that seat up. So it's just covering the bottom of your butt. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you said the saddles with the safety thing too because there was a video. Uh, ben and I did a video for um, – for Vance Outdoors in terms of like, uh, what my setup is, you know, using the products that we sell. So this particular instance was the Phantom and, you know, I'm like, I have the tension on this tether at all times. So if I slip off this platform, I'm not going any further than what you see me right now. I'm just going to swing around. I'm going to hurt my pride a little bit and I'm going to pop right back on. And then I was actually showing my wife that too. Of course, you know, she was worried about it. She's used to the traditional, safety line and, and climbing up a, you know, climbing up a ladder stand or whatever have you. And so I'm like, look, like I, I, I can just hang here all day. I don't even need this platform really. Like I can just sit here on the top of this step or just hang out. And so I definitely think that's an important piece to learn too, is that regardless yeah. which system you use, they're very, very safe. Yep. You cannot, you can't fall out of a saddle. It's, you'd have to really work at trying to fall out of a saddle. You'd I have think- to- yeah, you have to upside down and, and push something. yourself out because nobody's ever I, fell out of a saddle and they've been around a while. And uh, I think there was actually the video of Jared. Uh, I think he was like, "Well, what if you do that?" They were, you know, replying to trolling comments. They kind of go back to that. What if this happens? And he was like, "Upside down." <laughs> She's like, "Oh, there's oh, videos just... out there, my people." Like, yeah, I'll shoot. I'll shoot this way for sure. So, and there's been awesome. tens of thousands of people fall out of trees. Man. Tens and oh, tens. Oh, yeah. Of yeah, I mean, when I was younger, I, I I have. I mean, being stupid, you know, and I'm lucky it wasn't very high. But, um, yeah, for the saddle, for sure. Um, so kind of switching gears here a little bit. I know we want to get into some hunting stuff. We can't talk to you without talking about A, saddles, and B, and probably most importantly, scent control. I know you and I had talked a little bit. Obviously, I was giving you the story of Ben and I hunting this year and how 
as we were hunting, we were hunting the wind. We were in an oak flat, very uh, opening weekend of season. Um, we were basically getting rained on hardwood, you know, big woods, 300 some acre big woods. And uh, we had a coyote come up and hit our scent wall. And that coyote literally stopped at the, I mean, put on the brakes, locked them up and, and went right around and left. And yeah, you sent me your scent control regiment. So I want to give people, if they haven't heard your scent control spiel, which or, or life's not spiel is a bad word. I apologize, but, um, oh, that's okay. regiment, if you will, you know, your, your, your plan. I mean, you sent me those documents. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I feel like I'm taking a uh, biology or chemistry class or something here. Cause this is crazy. But if you want to kind of give people, uh, your, your, you know, your idea on, um, activated carbon and scent lock, we'll, we'll kind of sure. let you run with that. Okay. Uh, first off on Eberhard outdoors, my YouTube channel, um, I just posted part three of my scent okay. control regiment stuff. So part three just okay. posted yeah. last Friday and it's, it's, the mother of the parts, basically. There's going to be one more part on proper care and use. Uh, okay. But anyway, for anybody that wants to actually see and hear how this stuff works, I go through everything hands-on in part three. Uh, okay. But anyway, scent lock is something that I knew a lot about activated carbon, you know, back in the 90s when scent lock first came out. And I don't have the wind for 35 years. And I never in my wildest dreams would have thought there was something that could negate wind direction, where you didn't have yeah. to pay attention to wind. But being like I am, I'm always thinking of things that are going to give me some kind of an advantage. Yep. I kind of got that from Miles Keller. He was like, he's the only guy in the whole bow hunting industry I've ever looked up to was Miles Keller. And he was always looking for an edge. I can remember him wearing those uh, rubber head gears like women wear in the shower because yeah. he knew so much of his odor came out of his hair follicles on his head. Yeah. So you're always looking for that edge if you're a competitive person that wants to up your game. So I knew, well, I know this activated carbon, it's used in literally thousands of applications by governments, yeah. militaries, and worldwide industries. So I knew it was going to give me an advantage, and maybe I could fool more deer by not having them win me and give me a, a slight better advantage than I'm currently getting. Uh, to me, if you are not taking advantage of technology that's out there and you're just buying clothing because you, you're following, buying this high-profile stuff with no technology, I think that's crazy. <laughs> but anyway, so I bought Scent Lock, I think it was, I honestly don't remember if it was 96 or 97, but I bought it and it took me two years because the information Scent Lock gives you on care instructions is definitely not sufficient. It's yeah. definitely not even close to being sufficient to what you need. Not, co so not compared me. to what you do. Not, not, not even close. No, no. If you if you bought a cell lock suit and you took care of it the way they show you, yeah, you're probably going to be okay with whatever you have on your body. But you've got to have rubber, clean rubber boots. You've got to have a clean backpack. You've got to have a clean wrist strap. There's a lot of things you have to do in conjunction with scent lock to be scent free and not pay attention to wind. And it took me two years to get to the point where I learned on my own how to properly care for it, what to use in conjunction with it, how to store it, and how to use it. And it took me two years, and I got to the point where I actually went out and tested on deer, live deer. You know, I'd use scent lock one day, and then I'd use my old, you know, chamois cotton mossy oak suit the next day and i'd get busted yeah. the second day whereas i wouldn't get busted the first day it from the same deer with the same wind and so eventually i just got to the point where i just said i haven't paid attention to wind direction since 1999 i pay zero attention to wind uh 50 of the deer when i'm hunting since 1999 have probably been downwind to me because i don't pay attention when i go in uh, yeah the only time I ever pay attention to wind is when I'm setting up a tree at a primary scrape area. I will try to set up a tree if there's one available, kind of on the south or southeast side of the primary scrape area, about 20 yards, because mature bucks in Michigan and probably pressure areas, during the day, if they're going to check a scrape area, there's an excellent chance they'll just scent check it from downwind. So yeah. with the prevailing winds usually being out of the north or northwest, I try to set up a tree on the south or southeast side of the scrape area where I have a 20-yard shot to the scrapes. And then I also clear a shooting lane 20 to 25 yards downwind of me farther to the south or southeast. 
That way a buck can come anywhere from 40, 50, almost 50 yards, descent check it from downwind, I'm going to have a shot. Yeah. Whereas if they, you know, if I set up on the north side of the scrapes and the wind's out of the northwest, you know, I'm not worried about getting winded, but I'm just going to have a shot to the scrapes. If something sent checked it from 30 yards downwind on the south side, I wouldn't have that shot opportunity. So that's the only time I pay attention to wind is when I'm setting up a location. And that's crazy to think about because you're just so ingrained. I mean, wind direction, I mean, out west, it's one thing, right? Because you're sweating, you're, you're hiking, and you get, you got to do what you have to do. But, yep. you know, if you look at any big buck TV show, or, you know, all these products that people are trying to sell to cover this or to hide that or spray this, um, you know, it's just so ingrained into our industry that these things aren't, aren't necessary, right? And here you are completely out of left field doing something your own way and having great success with it. And so <clears throat> it's really interesting to see has that – has that, have you noticed, I guess what, what I'm trying to get at is, have you noticed more people are trying to use this approach or is, or is it just so ingrained, uh, you know, just to kind of play the wind? No, that, I've got, uh, I have, I have at least a thousand followers that don't pay attention to wind. I have lots of yeah. friends in Michigan. They haven't paid attention to wind in 20 years. Never, you know, I got yeah. them into it when I first started doing it. And, and one thing, I'm glad you mentioned the TV guys because, even the TV guys that are sponsored or used to be sponsored by Scentlock, Scentlock used to sponsor a lot of TV shows. You know, they would wear a Scentlock jacket and a Scentlock pants and maybe the gloves, but they would almost always, because they always want their faces to be seen, they'd wear a logo ball cap from one of their sponsors, their hair would be hanging out, they'd have beards, their necks are exposed, their faces are exposed, or they got stupid face paint on, which stinks. <laughs> and, and then, you know, if, if you are hunting pressured animals, you know, like on public land in Ohio or Michigan or up in New, New York, PA, they don't accept anything that's not right, okay? Yep. So if they get any hint of human odor, they're going to bust. Whereas these TV guys, they're hunting areas that are managed. They're hunting deer that aren't, haven't been shot at until they're three, four years old. So obviously they're going to tolerate human odor. They went past humans with no negative consequences while they're growing to maturity. So they... Yep. On the TV shows, they're going to get their opportunities no matter what. So they can have major flaws in everything they do. Their rattling sequences may suck. Their calling may suck. But because there's so many mature bucks and the rut's so competitive, they're going to kill their bucks. So for people to replicate what they do and expect it to have similar results on the few mature bucks they may be hunting on public land, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've heard you say that before. So that's kind of why I kind of threw that out there. Cause I knew that you were going to have a good response on that. Uh, you know, I've heard you say that exact piece and it makes sense. You know, what you see on TV isn't necessarily most likely not necessarily, but most likely yeah. is not real life for sure. And it's not yeah. the kind of situation. And it's interesting that you said that too, high pressure. So we had talked about Andrew, our, our pro staffer. And, um, so he hunted a piece of property this year that Ben and I went and we, we filmed and, and photographed and stuff. And, uh, it was right next to a lake with a highly pressured walking trail. So people are walking their dogs, they're walking, you know, just hiking themselves. And, uh, he's like, you know, I didn't pay one bit of attention to scent this year. And I, he was able to kill a stud of a buck. I mean, mm -hmm. 130, 140 class buck. And it, uh, it, it was a great deer. What he say? It was like 275, 300 pounds on the hoof. I mean, it was a big, big deer. And, you know, it just kind of depends on where you are and, and what you're doing and, you know, trying to take advantage of that situation. So you, you just answered your own question with your statement yeah. because he, he's hunting in an area that's a park basically. And there's a walking trail and people are walking by yeah. anytime you're in a park scenario or an inner city scenario where there's a lot of human activity, deer are mm -hmm. accustomed to that human activity and there's no threat to their livelihood. There's no yeah. danger involved in that human activity that they see every day. So yep. they are going to tolerate human odor because there's yep. never been any negative consequences when because they, of it. because of it. Yeah. So yep. they're going to tolerate human odors. So by him not having a scent control regimen, that yep. totally makes sense to me because those deer there tolerate some amount yep. of human odor. Yeah. And the other thing that was funny about that too is, uh, uh and we've talked about this story on the episode, but the, the buck that he was going after, he had on camera and, and what have you, but he was walking in. And he swears because he was wearing a solid, just a solid jacket on the way in, kind of mimicking normal traffic. Sure. Yep. 
it caught it caught him taking a leak before he went to the stand. The buck it saw was. him. It caught him taking a leak before he went to the stand. Yeah. So the buck the buck watched watched. He said I looked up and he was watching me use the bathroom and I was like, oh man, I just blew it this year, right? But he said I swear because I was wearing normal clothes and looking like a normal hiker and on the path, it yeah. just slowly turned around and walked away. And he's like, I knew where it was bedding, so I I hurried up. Dropped my stuff, hightailed it, just brought my bow and my camo, hightailed it to my tree. Again, a credit to Saddles because he was able just to sprint off and run and was able to get that buck in his bedding area. What was it? And watched him watched him go bed and was back in there first thing in the morning and killed him before 8 o'clock. I think it was, you know, he was in the stand maybe, and I'm messing up the details, but less than an hour before he was. He, my, he said, my wife wasn't even out of bed yet, and I killed this buck in the very, that afternoon right before that it watched them pee <laughs> so <laughs> that tells you the whole story right there <laughs> oh yeah exactly what a what a fun what a what a memorable story for sure so yeah in a regular public land in a high pressured area that buck he probably never would have seen that buck because he would have turned and left before he ever got sighted. Yep. That's, oh that's for sure abnormal situation for sure so I want to give you, this is something that uh, we had kind of talk, talked about a little bit. I want to throw some hy- hypothetical questions at you. I kind of got this from Mark Kenny, and I really like what Mark does and, and the uh, the guest that he has on. And I thought this was a really interesting series. And when you came on, I mean, I was I was glued to it. Uh, Ben's got some questions too. I don't know if you want to start in with some of the questions that you have or you want me to kind of throw these hypotheticals in first. Uh, it's really up to you. All right. Well, I'm a, I'm going to throw you a hypothetical question, and okay. it's going to it's going to tie in kind of a little bit uh, about what we've experienced here as as hunters ourselves. So, let's say it's mid October, John, and the season here the season here in Ohio starts at the end of September. I'm not sure uh, Michigan, but let's say you know last weekend of September the season started here. I know yeah. you're doing a lot of knock on door property, a lot of public land. Um, this is kind of a situation that I ran myself into this year as well. So, uh, maybe four or 500 yards away from my house, there's a farmer that has about 150 acres, about a mix of, uh, timber and ag, uh, this time of year, it was first, the first plant, it was, uh, mainly soybeans this year. So we had a lot of the food source. Yep. Short ag. A lot of the food source was, was kind of gone by the time I was getting in there and to hunt. Um, so take that in consideration. I've driven by this property a lot and I've always kind of looked at it from the road, but never had access to actually get in there and really truly scout. <clears throat> I know you're a big believer on like the, the 10 day rule. So you're out of state, you're out of state hunts, your 10 day hunts, you know, you're, you're, uh, scouting for a couple of days before you're hunting. Do you look at a situation like this? That's maybe you just in your backyard, but by going in there and scouting, you might have a potential of blowing this spot out. How would you kind of handle that? What kind of plan of attack would you take to kind of hunt this property that you remind you that you're in, kind of in the mid season, if you will? Yeah. Mid, I call that the October law. Yeah. First the off, October law. Anytime I'm going to a new property, which that was a new property, correct? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You have no option, but to scout. Yep. So you have to go, go in and do some scouting. Um, I would definitely 100% anything I do during season, I'm wearing a scent lock. Mm-hmm. Unless I'm dragging a deer out, that deer's dead. I'm not worried about it anymore. But okay. if I'm doing any scouting, I'm wearing scent lock from head to toe, so I'm not leaving any odor. Um, I would try to do it. Of course, you don't have that option because you got to do it the first day or two you're there. But uh, at home, if I had more time, I would try to pick a really windy or a rainy day, hard rainy day, to do my scouting. So it's going to dissipate my noise. I won't make the noise. Um, but on something like that, I would want to know the lay of the land first. Is yeah. it going to yeah. be, if it's a 10 day hunt and it's going to be in mid October, if well, there's let's not go. a bedding area. And maybe I misspoke on, maybe I misspoke on that. So this is a property that it's here in Ohio. So we, we don't necessarily have the 10 days. We can kind of hunt this. I actually ended up having the permission on this property for the remainder oh. of the year. Um, okay. so by the time that I able, was able to get permission on this property, it was, um, out of the blue about the end of mid to end of October. I wasn't able to truly start hunting it until kind of right getting into that close, for, that close part of the rut, if you will, Pre-run. give you a okay. little bit more a and it's, predominantly a uh, west strong west wind it's with it being ag there's a lot of strong uh, westerly winds out of that so well the first thing i would want to know is i would want to know what the bordering properties are so if there's timber on that property 
does that timber butt up to other timber, or is there a lot of other timber in the general vicinity where it gets hunted? Which okay. actually, that's what I would want. I would yeah. want the other timber on the bordering properties to get hunted. To have that. Pr- yes, and then I would go in again. I would have in full scent lock. I would hope like hell there's a bedding area. I'm a big bedding area guy. Okay. So I would go in and I would be busting deer out there. There's no question I would be blowing deer out of the bedding area if there were a bedding area on the property. And I'd, I'd go in ready to prep some trees because you're talking yeah. about, you know, it's knock on doors, so it's a private property. You could probably yeah. prep a tree or two yeah, in the sure. bedding area because you want to do this all in one visit. You don't want to come back the next day and spook deer out of there again. No, yep. You want one day of busting them out, and then that's done. The next time you go in there, you've got your hunting equipment, and you probably wouldn't go back until pre-rut you know, late October, yep. early November. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, but I would, I would go in, I'd prep a couple trees if it was in a bedding area, and I wouldn't go back again until pre-rut or else into the rut. I know your gun season opens in late uh, November or December. Yep, yep, yep. So you guys have an advantage because you guys can actually pre-rut hunt, which is when mature bucks, the does aren't in estrus yet, so mature bucks testosterone levels have risen, and they're actually starting to search for those early estrus does. And then you guys also can post-rut hunt prior to gun season. In Michigan, our yep. gun season opens during peak rut. So okay. we can't post-rut hunt is a waste of time because after gun season, it's done. So yeah. you can actually pre-rut hunt, you can peak rut hunt, and then you can post-rut hunt, which is usually around Thanksgiving, late November. Into yeah, Thanksgiving. exactly. And that's when most of the does now they have been bred They've been through their cycle, and now those big bucks have to actually get up off their asses and move, yep. searching for those late estrus does, same as they did during pre-rut when they're searching for early estrus does. Because during peak rut, the dominant bucks, the ones you really want to kill, the monsters, they're usually doed up. So they're yep. almost always with a hot dose. So they're not searching. They're not moving around much. So, But if you are in the bedding area, if you're hunting in the bedding area, that's where they typically do their breeding. So you do have an opportunity, to, even during peak rut, to kill a mature buck if you're within a bedding area. So I would definitely search the bedding area. I'd prep a couple of trees for hunting early November. And then I would also walk the perimeter, and it's going to totally depend on how many other people are hunting there. Whenever I hunt a knock on doors property, they give everybody permission to that. So it's yeah, like hunting exactly. public land. Yep. So, you know, for me to walk the perimeter and look, try to find white oaks or red oaks or a lost apple tree, you know, and expect a mature buck to visit that during daylight. If there's a lot of other hunters on this property, that's probably not going to happen. So it's, I would want to know how many other people are hunting on the property. Yeah. And if they're, if I was the only one they gave permission to, which that never happens, I've never Thanks. been in that no, scenario. Never. <laughs> never. Uh, I would set up on the perimeter. <laughs> You know, I would possibly okay. set up, uh, you know, close to the perimeter, maybe 30, 40 yards off the perimeter, because there's a slim uh, slim chance a buck would get up out of the bedding area to feed in, you know, still in October, and possibly right at dark he, when he would be physically entering the field. Yeah. I'd want to be 30, 40 yards off the field, so he might possibly go by me a minute or two or five or ten minutes prior to too dark to shoot. Yeah. I don't know what your shooting hours are there, but in Michigan, yeah, yeah, it's like five thirty. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mature bucks in Michigan just yeah. on pressured areas. Yeah. They just don't come out into crop fields, short crop fields in the daytime. It just doesn't. No. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I never experienced. And I never experienced that when I was there either. And I, I want to get your take too. So, kind of going back to this situation, I found a, a good um, scrape line. That was a low hanging branch tree. Um, it was a transition area between the larger time, soybean. What time did you find the scrape line, and was it active? Oh, it was active. I actually saw a uh, probably 110, uh, 100, 110-inch little small eight-point actively hitting that while I was in there, okay. um, hang, hanging, actually hanging to hunt. And um, so it was probably, I don't know when I hunted that, but it was probably, I'd have to go back, but it was early November, maybe even right in the rut, rutty time, pre, you know, pre-rut, maybe leading in right into kind of peak rut. Um, he hit that probably, I want to say lunchtime. He was probably hitting there. I mean, just you weren't stopping him. I mean, there was no stop him. He was on a mission. He hit his scrape sure. and he went right, right down the, it was a, uh, 
kind of a nice steep slope and just right down into kind of more of the ravine area right after that. But are you looking at scrape lines in that, in that particular time of the year, or is that more safe towards a different type of the year? Or are you just primarily uh, If bad I line? see an active scrape line, I would definitely set up on it without, okay. without question, because a scrape line is something that a buck, usually it's a particular buck. That's his yeah. route. That's his route entering, you know, in the morning or in the evening. Hopefully it's in, during daylight, which obviously yeah. is what, saw that yep, buck. Yep. Uh, I would definitely set up on a scrape line and if it was active I would hunt it immediately. Okay. I would hunt it immediately because if it's active and it's especially if it's pre rut, that means he's physically moving and searching for early estrus stoves. As soon as he finds an early estrus stove or he, as soon as rut starts, that scrape I almost guarantee that scrape line is gonna become inactive because he's gonna be with estrus stoves. He's not gonna have yep. any reason to send check for does along that scrape line so yeah. yeah i would set i would set that up as, if it was active i'd hunt it that next evening yeah <laughs> and it or was that actually, day it, when i was in there i might hunt it that very evening if I, yeah hunt it that same evening yeah and it was funny because i when i walked in there there was a blind and i was like god mm-hmm. damn you know come on like of course there's a blind where i found this scrape line right i mean go figure and so uh, a but luckily, blind or a tree scene? uh it was a, it was a real like you know like a pop-up hunter blind okay. right and um it was sitting probably 20 30 yards off the scrape line and i uh i was like darn it i was like you know what i'm gonna set up 30 or 40 yards on the other side so i have I, at that time you know i'm still hunting the wind at that point so i was downwind of it exactly where i needed to be and john he came five feet right in front of me i i was like how i mean i must have done something right you know he, yeah, he came right 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 in front of me by the time i realized he was there he i you know i tried to grunt at him you know did a and he, he didn't care he he was on a mission and he was headed to that scrape i got a cool video i'll have to send you of him just just <laughs> railing this scrape and then off he, so went. he went by so, and you never got a shot no he by the time i realized he was on me because it was windy that day by the time i realized he was on me he he ran right right in front of me just trotting hit a scrape went right off so now I know what to look forward to this year, too, because I'm assuming that they're going to kind of keep that same and, pattern. So. And you know what, Josh? You have to be very attentive when you're hunting a scrape line. Anytime you're hunting a transition corridor, which that is, they are moving, especially midday, they move with a vengeance. I mean, they have yeah. a purpose in mind. They're not just slowly walking and browsing no. and picking leaves here and there. They are moving. So you have to be very attentive. Uh, you just weren't it. I mean, you yeah, did everything just was, perfect other yeah. than you weren't attentive enough to see him early yeah. enough to get that shot. And that was kind of the, the and then kind, kind of to go back to the saddle thing as well. So I had my saddle positioned to where that tree, uh, he was on the, and you can see me, but the listeners probably can't at this point, but that was on my strong side. So where okay. that, where that scrape line oh, was, was on my perfect. strong side. And so he came up from behind me and that was the only downside to having the saddle, if you will, is by the time I realized he was there to grab my bow off the right hand side of the tree and bring it over. It just, it, there was just no, no possible way, but it made for a really cool experience and, and definitely one to look forward to, you know, in the year, you know, this, this next coming season. So. Okay. I've got to ask you a question because you said the buck, you're right-handed. Yes. You're right-handed. You said yes. the buck was on your strong side, which is your left side. He, he came from my right. So he came from, uh, if, if I'm looking, it's, he came from about five o'clock. But you said when, he, when it was time to shoot him, he was on your strong side, so he was on your left He was on my strong side. By the time he hit the strong side, it was 30, 40 yards at that point. Why was and your bow hanging on the right side of the tree as opposed wait, to the left side of the tree? I guess I misspoke on that one, didn't I? Yeah, so my bow was definitely on the left side of the tree. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. But, yeah, my bow was definitely on the – by the time I got to it and noticed that he was there, he, was already, he, was, he, was, already, he was already gone at that point. They so, do move – they do move briskly when they're on. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. That's one. That's definitely a takeaway that I gained from that one for sure. So this year they're actually planting it in corn. So my, tra- my transition Ooh. or my, uh, yeah. So walking into that is yeah. going to be a little bit more of a challenge. I'm going to have to kind of go to the North side of the property and kind of walk the line and kind of drop in. Um, I won't be able to transition through the corn. It would take me, it would take me forever to get through the corn to get to that spot. It was probably a good half mile walk back, uh, probably 800 to 900 yards back off the road. I would definitely so. not walk the tree line. No. Okay. No, I would walk. I know you don't want to walk through the, through the corn from a road or something because it's such yeah. a long walk, but when you're walk instead of walking the tree line, do the rows run parallel to the tree line? 
Uh, it's kind of like an L shape, so you you can see me. So we're going to. Then, no, do the up. corn do the corn rows? You think the corn rows will run parallel to the tree line? Yes. Okay. Yep. Do you want to get in about ten rows of corn and walk walk through, through the, corn, the corn rows, and then when you get even to the tree or where you want to go in, cut in. Because a lot of times yep. when you walk the actual tree line along the edge of a crop field, whether it's standing corn or short crop. A lot of times there's, doe, there's does or maybe a subordinate buck or maybe even the buck you want to kill, he's bedded inside there not very far. So by you walking the tree line, you are gonna you could potentially bump deer on the inside okay. of that tree line. Whereas yeah. if you're walking through the corn, you're not going to spook anything on the inside of the tree line with your entry. Okay. You're just going to cut right to that tree. No, cool. That, yeah, that definitely helps. I'll definitely keep that in mind for sure. Maybe I'll have to give you a call and, <laughs> and show you. Entries, entries are a major, major, major. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what, you know, having the yeah. permission is cool. There was one property I just didn't simply hunt. I, you know, I was able to get the permission, and I'm just like, you know, I don't, I don't know how I can get in here without busting every, everything anywhere. Like, it just it was just wasn't, wasn't really feasible to kind of get in there. I appreciated the permission, but it was just like, you know, at that point, it's like, how do I, how do I get in there? You know, so. Also, keep in mind, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Is it a big crop field? Uh, no, not, not, not yeah. It, I would say small to medium. Acre wide. Ah, I think the property on Onyx. So the the just the crop the permission field. just the crop field probably it's probably thirty acres at least. Yeah, yeah, at least, yeah. I would, I would prep a, I would go in there and prep a tree along that edge. Yeah. And uh, while the corn is standing, let's say mid October during the October lull, go in there and Watch do a rattle that. sequence in the evening or even in yeah. the morning. Because uh, they are very susceptible to coming into rattling as long as they got security cover, which standing corn is security cover to security cover in the yeah. timber. They're very susceptible to rattling because they're still figuring out pecking order prior to the rut. Yeah, and there's definitely there's definitely some good opportunity on the southeast side of that field or southwest side of that field that I could get into too. There's a little uh, timber patch down on the bottom side of the the corn. It's kind of the the woods and the corn and then or, or beans last year. It, it's kind of runs in the middle of it, and so there's yeah. a good wood patch, a good a good wood patch, some some ag, and then the other wood patch that kind of is a transition from the other property that's mainly just timber. So it's kind of like a good you can kind of hunt either side of that corn if you will. So. I'll definitely keep, keep that in mind. mind for sure. Anytime you're hunting a perimeter of a standing cornfield where you got security cover to security cover, those I call those freebie hunts because you can hunt those. They're freebie hunts because you can hunt them without negative consequences to any of your rut phase locations that you're going to be hunting during the rut phase that are back in the timber because yep. they're edge spots. So you're going to be walking through the corn, going to your tree, hunting going back out into the corn and leaving. You're not going to be entering or intruding and altering doe activity at your rut phase location back in the woods. So okay. those are freebie okay. spots. Okay, for sure, yeah. That's that's great advice. So thank you. Um, ben, you got some. Yeah, so my stuff is coming from uh, strictly from a super beginner level. Yeah. You know, because I've small game hunted my whole life, but, you know, the past couple of years I've, I've wanted to get into deer hunting and um, I guess it's it's going to be a self-serving couple questions, but um, but there's listeners out there that probably can find themselves in the same situation yeah, too. So. Yeah, so um, that's what there where I was coming at that angle. Like, hopefully, we teach some people that are getting into hunting some things. And uh, um, basically, I just I have the saddle, I have all the gear, I have all that stuff. Um, you know, scent lock suit. Um, I guess from from my standpoint. If you were starting out, what are like what are the most important things you would say to somebody like me getting into deer hunting? Like, I know scent control is huge for you, but um, like when you're talking yeah. about bedding areas and scrape lines, and I I know what a scrape looks like, but I don't know what a scrape line looks like. Sure. I don't necessarily know. I know they bed in thick cover and and stuff like that, but. I may not like as far as scouting, like you and Jordan were talking about when you go into a new property. Yeah. I don't necessarily know what to look for. Uh, so maybe some pointers on that or like maybe something that you just advice you would give to a new hunter when they're starting out, what they should do to maybe uh, increase their, their success and, in, in, you know, getting a deer. 
there are several things. First thing I would suggest is do most of your scouting. It's too late now, but do most of your scouting in location preparation during postseason. As soon as the mm-hmm. snow melts, depending on the state you're in, you know, have most of your scouting and location prep done by the end of October before green up. Uh, because then when you're scouting an area during postseason and you're going to hunt it primarily in the rut, the rut phases is when most of the big bucks are killed. I mean, that's just statistically, that's a fact. So during post postseason, you're looking at trees, the way they're going to look when you go in and hunt them when the foliage is down during the rut phases. Yeah. The landscape's going to look the same. The foliage is going to be off. When you go out and you're pre-season scout or this time of year, everything's green. It looks like it's got a lot of security cover. But once you get back in there and it's November, all the leaves are down, and now you look naked. So yeah. mm-hmm. you're looking during postseason, you're looking at your location, security cover-wise and height-wise, how high you need to get in the tree in the same look that it's going to look like when you physically go in and hunt it. So you may set up during preseason in a location and you set up 18 feet off the ground because you got lots of background cover because there's leaves. So you go back there, you know, during the rut, and now you stick out like a sort of thumb because you're sticking out on the side of a, a leafless tree yeah. and you got no mm-hmm. background cover. So do most of your scouting postseason and definitely on it for a newbie, definitely go search bedding areas, put a couple locations in bedding areas. You're going to get more opportunities if you're trying to kill mature bucks in bedding areas than you are any place else, period. Especially if you're in, and the more pressured the property, the more apt your opportunities are, are going to be in a bedding area because that's where the deer feel secure to move during daylight hours. All the, all the activity and all the sign in the world is worthless. If you're trying to kill the buck that made it, and he's only during that doing those that sign after dark, you know you've yeah. got to look for places that have the adequate. Everything revolves around security cover. Because mature bucks don't like to go any place where they don't have a quick exit route. So security cover, security cover, security cover. I always always push that. So gravitate all your hunting around security cover. Now, if you're going on heavily pressured public land. Then what you want to do is pretend everybody that's hunting there is trying to kill you. Yeah. Where are the only places you're going to go on this property where you might feel comfortable getting up and moving during daylight hours? Typically, that's going to require you wearing waders or hip boots or using a canoe or a boat to access places. Other hunters are just too lazy to hunt. So, you know, killing mature bucks in pressured areas requires a lot of work. It requires you to hunt differently than all the other people. Otherwise... You hunt like everybody else, unless you feel like you're just a luckier person than they are, you shouldn't expect any different results. Mm -hmm. You have to work harder than everybody else. And that's, I think that kind of echoes the point, like why we work so hard. So the the one piece of land that I was telling you that we had the 300 acres, that was the state uh, raffle drawing. We had it for two weeks um, and we can only scout our first day. So we weren't able to scout any time ahead of time. So Part of your two weeks, you had to scout, and this kind of goes back into your tactics in terms of like out of state hunts and and scouting. You know, the first few days, I think we walked in. It was a mile hike, and we were huffing and we were sweaty, and, and it was just a, a miserable time. But I knew the type of people that hunt. What time of year was it? What? That was o- opening weekend, so we had okay. it. I um, the only time that I was able to get it was the the first day of season, which sure, why not? You know, and um, and for two weeks after. So I couldn't hunt every day. I could only hunt, you know, after work or whatever, our evening hunts at that point, you know, it's probably, what would you say? Seven thirty, eight o'clock. We were getting dark. Yeah. Excuse me. And so, uh, I was like, you know, we know the type of hunters that we're going to have. And if, if we, and I, you know, to go back to your reference, if someone's trying to kill me, I certainly don't want to walk a mile and a half to go, <laughs> to go hunt, you know? And so maybe I'll try here and be a little bit lazy, if you will. And, uh, we had, we recovered, we recovered in does. We never had an opportunity, uh, one opportunity I missed, but we recovered in does. And I think that all stems back to just putting in that extra effort and really trying to get back there as far as we possibly could. So yep. no, in September, that makes sense to your cover. I mean, that you'd see more does. Yeah. Those are much more apt to be daytime bedding to feeding and you're probably yep. hunting in smoke. So yeah. Just... It was evening around, you know, around six o'clock it heated up. For sure. I mean, it would always heat up around six o'clock and we would, you know, they would just be just ahead of us a little bit. We had really good winds. I mean, we're, we're hunting the wind still here. 
Um, yeah. the, the winds, the winds were strong and out of the West and they, we had no, op, no, no chance of even blowing anything out all the way up until the point where we hunted. So cool. Nice. You got another one. Hey, all you can do is get opportunities. If you mess them up, yeah. that's your problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I certainly had my opportunities and I certainly effed them up. That's for sure. <laughs> well, that's okay. You know what? I've messed up lots of opportunities, but that's all in the yeah. learning process. And I oh, still for sure. Them, so. <laughs> you got another one, dude. Um, how do you feel about on, like, say I've got a property that I have permission to hunt on. How do you feel about setting up a mock scrape? Oh yeah, that's good. Cool. Mock scrapes like work vine. really well. Yeah. yeah. Mock That's scrapes what work I did really to... well. You just, you just always want to put a mock scrape where you know there's quite a bit of doe activity. Because yeah. all buck activity during the rut phases, all buck activity of primary scrape areas revolves around doe activity. So mock scrapes work great. I don't do them anymore because my closest place I have to hunt is 35 minutes from my house. And most yeah. of the hunting I do is a two and a half hours to the south of me down in public land in southern Michigan. So I don't have the opportunity really to do mock scrapes and keep them going. Uh, okay. But I did in the past, and mock scrapes work really well. It's, it all depends on how you set them up, where you set them up. Um, you know, they, they, the more you gravitate putting mock scrapes around places where you know there's no activity, the more activity it's going to get from bucks for sure. Yeah, I set, I set one up at the property that I have permission on, and it was it's basic. Well, I didn't really know where they were, so I set up a mineral site to see where in a camera to see where the deer were coming from and try to figure out where the travel routes were. Um, yep. And I realized that there's bedding behind this field, and they go through another, you know, a tree line, and there's like a cut they cross across a river, a little creek. And um, so I put a mock scrape on the edge of the field, and... I got a look at, um, you know, the bucks that were traveling through. This is a small property, so I know that there are only like two bucks that stay on the property, and then the rest of the time, the bigger deer that I saw, they were traveling through, and I saw them maybe um, a week and a half in between. You know, I'd see them, and then it'd be a week and a half, and I wouldn't see them. And I always saw them at night on camera. Um, I never saw them during the day. What time of night was the picture? Yeah, it was like yeah. 4 a.m., 2 a.m. It was really sporadic. There was no no consistency there, sure. uh, even what in kinda, the rut. When you said you set it up on the edge of a crop field, what was the crop field? Was it beans? Uh, last year it was beans. Was beans yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was, one, that was one thing right there. If you want to do a mock scrape and you're going to do it along the edge of a crop field, do it when it's standing corn. Again, it okay. all boils mm-hmm. down to that security cover. If you're looking for a daytime visit by a mature buck, you've got to have security cover on both sides. And that, okay. might, and that might be a good tip for me this year too. I mean, to hunt, to throw that mock scrape right on that security cover between that wood line and that that corn line, that's, mm-hmm. it's going to come up this year for sure. And then people don't so. put enough hunters don't put enough emphasis on security cover when you're pursuing mature bucks in any semblance of pressured areas. You have to have security cover. So if you have, let's say, let's say there's an apple tree. And because a lot of times if there's an apple tree and they have, and they're producing apples that year, and let's say it's borders, it's relatively close to the edge of a standing cornfield. Okay. So you got an mm-hmm. apple tree. Let's say you go in and do a preseason speed tour, which is what I do in my cell lock. And let's say there's several scrapes underneath that apple tree. Okay. If there's if possibly a buck bedding in the corn could come in and eat apples because he's right there at the security cover edge. If, let's say there's a buck bedded 200 yards away, deeper into the timber, there's a bedding area. And let's say there's 100 yards of open timber between that bedding area and that apple tree. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. A mature buck is not going to get up out of the security cover of that bedding area and walk through that vulnerable open timber with no understory to eat apples at this apple tree that has security cover with standing corn next to it he's just not going to make that vulnerable movement during daylight hours now Mm -hmm. he's probably going to go in there after dark and eat apples or go check for no activity but if there's not transition security cover from a bedding area to a feeding location or a scrape area and you think that buck's bedding in that bedding area he's not going to trans he's not going to make that transition through vulnerable areas 
to get to that place, even though that place has the adequate security cover for a buck to be at during daylight. He's just not going to make that vulnerable movement. Yeah. So you have okay. to have the transition security cover to go along with the security cover at the location you're setting up at. That makes sense for sure. Cool. You got something? The- you're, he's like his his he's ready to go, man. He's ready for September. And he's like, let's, yeah. do, let's yeah. get going. It's it's gonna be in corn this year, John. So yeah. I'm I'm gonna take that advice and you know find the find a good spot to hang a mock scrape on the edge of the corn. Um, it's it's new to me, so I'm I'm learning yeah. every time I hear a podcaster talk to somebody new, and and uh, you know I appreciate you giving your advice. Oh yeah, you know, and I've I've listened to you know the podcast with you and Bo, and um, that story kind of reminded me of the where you were talking about the you know the the buck that was hot and heavy on a doe, and she came out and was like taunting him, and he stayed in the cover. Oh yeah, and yeah. oh yeah, I remember that one. <clears throat> Twenty three and a half inch wide that. ten point that I shot in Missouri, one hundred sixty inch ten point. He he came around and he was gonna go around the tree because the doe buck that he came out she came out of standing corn. And he came around the tree and was going to push her back into the corn. He did not want her to leave the security cover where he wanted to bring mm-hmm. her. Yeah. yeah. He's like, get back in here, honey. Yeah. I don't want to go out he there. I know John's out. John's out there. <laughs> <laughs> he said, John's out there. Come on now. Give me a chance. Here. <laughs> yeah, That's that awesome. particular hunt, I hunted all day, daylight till dark, in the rain for three straight days. And I shot him on the fourth morning. So I want to throw you a curveball because you mentioned Missouri, um, and I didn't plan on asking this, but if it's, it's a simple question, <clears throat> let's say you have the ability to hunt any state. I gave you a magic, a magic golden ticket. Any state, any time of the year. Where are we going? Kansas, Kansas, Kansas? or Iowa? It'd be a toss up yeah. between Kansas and Iowa, and it would depend on the property that I had on. Sure, sure. Yeah. Public awesome. land. I think public land in. Uh, it's it's all because there's so many different types of public land. Oh sure, sure. Public land in Iowa. I've hunted public land in Iowa and been very successful because it had a lot of understory. It had a lot of briars and bushes and stuff because they get more rain. You know yeah. where I hunt in Kansas, it's relatively arid because I'm out in the plainsy part of the state. So you know it's it's a lot easier to hunt because you know milo is the main crop out there. Once in a while you'll see standing corn, but by the time we go out there during post rut, it's all down. So basically, the only place the deer have to transition through in the daytime is the old floodplains draws. So literally, 10% of the landscape is made up of these timber-laden draws. So all the deer are condensed in this very small transition area. And all you got to do is walk through there when you're scouting and find a pinch point. There's going to be scrapes everywhere. There's going to be grubs everywhere. And you set up a location. Uh, So Kansas... If you go out west in Kansas, it's easier to, yeah. to hunt. But I think Iowa, I don't know, if you're hunting a timber area in Iowa, it seems to be better than Kansas. But the draws mm-hmm. area is definitely yeah. easier. Yeah, I was going to say, it's always going to be a draw system. I, to the begrudgment of some people listening here, I wish Ohio at some point would have a draw system as well because it just makes, I think it just makes the quality quality yeah. that much better. And you, and you see that in the results that people get in, in southern Iowa and in Kansas. So. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You guys are a state that if you own private property, you don't even have to buy a deer license. Yeah, in some regards. Yeah, mm-hmm. if you do land under, yeah, land, yeah, land under tag. You know, um, you know, we had talked to Adrian. I, I'm kind of, he's kind of lucky too because down in Tennessee, he's get he gets the uh, the velvet hunt in Tennessee, and then yeah. he also gets you know a normal a normal hunt as well. And I think he was saying they at one point they were getting three bucks, and now I think they're down to two. You know, we're only down to the one, but. Uh, yeah, he was getting he's getting two bucks. I'm like, man, it must be nice. He's like, we used to get three, and I was like, oh, jeez. Be careful what be careful what yeah, you no wish doubt. for. Yeah, yeah, of course the quality diminished, and he he mentioned that on the episode as well. That was a couple a couple ago. I think that was episode 17. Um, but yeah, he mentioned that as well. You know, the quality was definitely down. He was glad that they went to two, and so. Give you an idea, Indiana about ten years ago, they used to be a two buck state, and Indiana because yeah. I keep all the stats in my books. Um, Indiana, until they went to a single buck 10 years yeah. ago, they were like number 15 on the P&Y entries per licensed hunters category. Now yeah. they're at number five. Yeah. So by going from two bucks to one buck, they went up 10 spots. They're, the only states better than them are 
Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, and I think Nebraska, as yeah. far as P&Y entries for licensed hunters. And I'm glad you mentioned that because actually tomorrow we're, reco- uh, we're recording an episode with Dustin Huff, who shot the Huff Buck uh, last year. It was the, the largest typical whitetail taken in the U.S., not in North America, but just in the U.S. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Mark's uh, counterpart there at some times on the Wired to Hunt, but Spencer Newharth was mentioning, and I think Mark even mentioned it as well, that, that he was wanting to know the timing because of how Indiana switched from that two buck state to the one buck. And then obviously this guy was off, afforded the opportunity to kill, you know, the biggest white tail in the United States. And so it's interesting that you brought that up too, because it uh, clearly it makes, makes a difference. You know, maybe that buck doesn't make it big through. Big so. difference. You look at all the big buck states and they're almost all one, buck, one and done. Yeah. So we talk about these states that you've hunted, um, you've, you know, you, with 60 plus deer or, you know, all Pope and young bucks, what uh is there one out of those that sticks out the most what's your most memorable whitetail hunt out of state or period uh just in general let's just go in general what was, what's your what's the one hunt that kind of yeah, sticks hand, out about the rest and hands down to like in 2000 the year 2000 i shot a buck that my buddy had named weezer so okay. there was like 35 hunters bow hunters in the hunting in this section it was all it was private you know, that I don't remember how many acres this particular piece was, but bow within hunters. the section, there was like at least 35 bow hunters and probably okay. six gun hunters. So heavily pressured like, like public land. And I hunted this buck that he ended up naming Weezer because he bedded in this one particular area of tall weed, this big tall weed field, and there was no trees in it. So it was almost impossible to hunt, and the weeds were too dense even to put up a ground line, you know, because you could literally see three feet in these weeds. I don't know what kind of weeds they were, but they were just different. And I can remember one, it got to the point where I was going in four hours before daylight to try and catch this buck coming into this weed field, because I was hunting the perimeter of the weed field, butting up to a swamp. And I was trying to catch him going, but he was always going into the bedding area, leaving crops or whatever, and going in about two hours before daylight. So I started going in four hours before daylight to hopefully catch him maybe having already transitioned into the wheat field and still being close to his bed. And anyway, the day I ended up killing him, it was a windy day. It was during pre-rut. It was actually it was November 1st. It was November 1st, 2000, and it was windy, and there was a big patch of uh, red brush on the edge of this weed field, and there was a big popple tree on this ditch. There was a big muddy ditch, and I was up in this pot. I got up in this popple tree, and I'm when I say windy, it was probably 30 mile an hour wind, <laughs> stiff wind. Yeah, and I was literally 10 yards from this red brush, and there was a primary scrape area off to the side of this red brush. And I, I was expecting this deer to come out of the weed field to the scrapes, hopefully, that particular evening. I mean, after three years of hunting this deer, two years, and then this was the third year I hunted him, I actually never thought I was going to kill this deer. And anyway, so I get up in the tree, and it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He stood up in that red brush. Oh. So he literally was bedded in that red brush while I crossed that muddy ditch with my waders got into my tree and he never heard me. Literally, he was 10 yards into it, so he was like 20 yards from me. Never heard me. And he stood up in the red brush and I about fell out of my tree. <laughs> I was like, what the <laughs> hell? How would he be there and not hear me or see me? No doubt. In? And uh, and then he kind of walked out of the red brush and circled around to those scrapes and I shot him at 35 yards. No, what he ended up... Th- did you get a score on him? What was his? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, score? he was just—he was under 130. He was in the high 120s. One, he was just, just the, the smartest deer. To yeah. give you an example, on this one hunt, this is the hunt that blew my mind. I was hunting out of that same tree, and I could see this buck coming through the weed field. And this was—this would have been late October. This would have been pre-rut. And he was walking through this weed field, and he came up close to this, close to the edge. He walked through that red brush, 
which I couldn't shoot from where he came into that red brush. He came through the red brush, and before he would stick his nose out, because there was about a five-yard buffer of grass between the edge of the red brush and the ditch. And before he would stick, before he stuck his nose out and gave me a shot, because I could have shot that distance where he was. He snorted. He indeed didn't snort, but he did. He did a wheeze. He did a really loud wheeze, and it was dead calm that evening. And there was a bean field across the ditch. I was kind of in the corner of some timber, and then there was a bean field, and then that big weed field off to the to the east. There was several does out in this bean field. When he wheezed, I swear to God, this is going to sound like BS, three big does walked over there, crossed that muddy-ass ditch, and that little five-yard buffer of grass, they walked up and down through there, scent-checking and sniffing everything. Uh-oh, and wow. by the time they got done doing that, they moved back over into the bean field, and it was dark. It was it was to the point where it was too dark for me to shoot. Wow. And then he came across and crossed. I could see barely see his silhouette. Man. And yeah, that's how the, he got the name Weezer at. Yeah, he had, had the, the ladies do the dirty work for him there, checking. He did. Wow. It was like looking at so watching cool. bodyguards. Yeah checking stuff out before the president came out. You know, Man, that's wild. Weird. That's, cool. that's I, cool. I've never seen that ever happen by another deer ever. That's unique. Yeah, that definitely has to be. Man, that would be one for sure to have it on video just to, to and replay when, that. And when I shot that deer, that, that evening in the high winds when I shot that deer, he had a 12-gauge slug in his ass. He had two <laughs> double-out buckshot in his neck, and he had a two-and-a-quarter-inch vortex broadhead Chis- the chisel point was sticking yeah. out of his left shoulder. That broadhead had went below his spine on his right side, over his shoulder, went through the top of his left lung, was all scar tissued over, and that, that broadhead had about an wow. inch of shaft on it, and it was totally encapsulated in cartilage. So yeah. that had been there at least a year. Yeah. And that's what? why that buck was just so, so smart. He should have been dead <laughs> <laughs> by somebody else, but he, yeah. he wasn't, and he was smart. What a what a warrior! That's there were awesome. several other stories I yeah. could tell about that deer on other hunts for that deer, but yeah. I'll just leave it with that. No, one. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, we're getting on here pretty long. I don't know how we've been recording, but it seems like we've been recording for a good bit. I wanted to let the listeners know too. So, let's say you're you're someone like me who who shoots uh, or wears first light gear or wears merino gear right now. So, let's say I'm looking into getting into the activated carbon. This is one thing I wanted to make sure I touched on. I know you've said it in the in the past as well as even on this episode, but what's one biggest thing that I can start to do to uh, to build that kit out, if you will, to be completely scent free? I know there's a particular area of the body that I know that you're probably going to address on this, but how how do uh, what's the biggest area of um, I guess uh, that I should look your at? Or should I, yeah, yeah, what should I pay attention to the most? Your squash, your head. Yep. 40% of your odor comes out of your hair follicles, your beard, your neck, your ears, your nose, and your mouth. And so, scent lock, you know, to do scent lock correctly, you have to wear a head cover with a drop-down face mask covering yep. your mouth and nose. Yep. But I, I, let me let me mention this. If somebody wants my scent control regiment, it's, uh, I've got 12 canned documents that I will send them. Yep. And uh, I'll give you my email address if somebody wants to. Yeah, what can we? What, D, go ahead. Okay, D D E E R J O H N five one the number five one at gmail dot com. So dear John fifty one at gmail dot com, and it's D E E R not D E A R. Yep. And I just ask for scent control regiment, and I'll know what to do. Yeah, I've you sent you sent that packet. Of them, though, yeah, you sent that packet to me, and like I said, I was starting to look at it. I'm like, holy crap, I need to I need to take a master course on this because it was very very in depth. Very in depth. You know and what, so, though, Josh. Once once you get that process, I would also suggest watching part three on the Ebert. Yeah, yeah, video. definitely. Once you get the process down, it's automatic. If I pulled up, if you and I were hunting together, and you pulled up in your pickup truck, and I pulled up behind you in my minivan, and we were going to get ready to go out in the woods, I one hundred percent guarantee you, I will be dressed and out of my van before you are. I'm glad you mentioned that. We uh, Ben smiled when you said minivan because I know that may, that makes him chuckle. What's Greg call it? The minivan, mom de- van of death, or something? Of death. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have owned uh, 
I don't know, seven or eight minivans. I used to have Chryslers, but I always had problems with Chryslers, so I've had the last four were Toyotas. And I take all the seats out the day I buy it. I don't put them in until I sell it. Uh, it's like a little motel room in the back, so yep. I just slide between the seats with the radio mm-hmm. running and the heat on, and I change all my clothes, and when I open the slide door, I walk out with my bow backpack on and it's lock, and I'm ready to hunt. He's ready to run. And it takes yep. me literally three minutes. The question is, how come you haven't got Taylor to get on the minivan game yet since he's, uh, you know, hunting all those burbs over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've really never discussed that with Taylor. Yeah, we need, we need to get Taylor and Billy, uh, Billy Phillips, we need to get those guys some <laughs> minivans of death. That way they can blend in with all the soccer moms in D.C. <laughs> Did Taylor ever tell you about the story where he shot the deer and went in the ladies' pool? You, we, he, and it's funny because when we first talked, he's, I told you that we had talked to Taylor and he, you were like, did he mention that to you? And, and so I texted him. He's like, oh my God, that's his favorite story. He tells everyone he wants to. He kind of mentioned it briefly, like in, in like a, in an answer to a question, but never truly in, in went in depth with it. So let, let's go ahead and say it now because we've teased it up enough, but this is hilarious. It's a hilarious story. And if you want to hear more about Taylor and Billy, definitely go back and listen to this podcast about them hunting in the burbs. But John, you go ahead because you tell, you'll tell it way better than I will. <laughs> well, Taylor used to be a stand-up comedian, so he, he tells the story pretty good. But anyway, <laughs> he, hunts, he hunts the burbs, and he hunts through April. So he has special permits from Washington, D.C., yep. where he hunts. Yep. And he... He hunts these communities where he goes in and he goes to their uh, city council or whatever and gets permission. Well, there was this yep. one lady that in this one area he was hunting. And he's literally hunting just outside their yard yep. in the you know the trees running behind their houses and stuff. And this one elderly lady, she had a swimming pool, and he's hunting down, I don't know, 30, 40 yards below her house in timber. And he had a doe come through, and he shot this doe. And because it was November, you know, the pool was somewhat drained. It had a little bit of water in the bottom, and it had a cover over the top of the water. And the doe ran up up the hill, and Taylor's, Taylor <laughs> told me, that, man, I'm like, don't go in that lady's yard. Well, it was way worse than that. The lady was actually in the house yeah. watching TV, and the slider <laughs> window cover was open. And the deer, that doe, ran into the pool, and he said she couldn't get out. She died in the pool because she couldn't get up the, yeah. the sides. And the, he said that cover was ripped to hell. The water was pink. And that lady, when he walked up there, he had to take the heat. He walked up there, and she did not want hunting in the community in the first place. She was very yeah. an anti-hunter. She, and he says, it was this little old lady, and Taylor's like six. six. Yeah. Taylor said she just reamed him up one side and down the other, and he just stood there and took it. And he cost him like twenty five hundred dollars because he yep. had to have the pool cleaned and a new cover. And yep, yep. That's that probably his. That's probably his story. lowest. There's a lot of low moments that he's had. I think using the restroom in his saddle is one of them, and then uh, <laughs> that one's probably oh, on the list. That. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> one and two. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, John, it's been great. Um, I can't wait for you to come down here and hang out with us. I think you're going to pick your brain even more and, and get some more insight with you. You know, we'll be getting close to season. We'll be close to season. We'll probably be just about a month away, actually. It'll be almost yeah. exactly a month away. I think the season opens September 27th um, or, or close to that. And uh, we'll come down. This will be at our location here in Hebron. So we'll be excited to get you here for that. And then um, – you know, for those of you listeners coming out, this is a free event. Anyone can come check it out. You want to learn about the, e- the you know, the ESS or the Eberhardt series saddle, you know, we'll have them. You know, you can check it out. You can sit in it. You can do all that fun stuff and get some tips from John while you're at it. I don't think there's any better better way to, to, to get started in saddle hunting than to try to attend one of these events. So I'm really, really, really looking forward to having you on here. I know I speak for Ben there as well. So, Hey, Josh, can I clarify one thing for these yeah. guys that are listening? Because yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're going to have that indoors. So if it's raining, yes. don't feel like you're going to be outside. It's going to yep, be it'll be an indoor event. Yep, we'll be right there in our, our main uh, atrium area, if you will, or open uh, showroom floor. And then we're also going to have some food trucks available as well. So definitely come out, hang out. All your tethered gear will be there. Your sticks, your your saddles, you know, all your accessory pouches, and, what, and of course all the other great stuff that we have to offer. So definitely come out and check that out. It'll be the only one in Ohio. So we're very very looking much looking forward to that so 
I appreciate you coming on today and, and well, you, spilling guys. your knowledge yeah, on us a little bit. I know that was just a little bit. That was probably just a creamer to the coffee on what's, what, you, what you really know. But uh, we look forward to seeing you again and having you coming out and, and really diving into more with us. So Appreciate it, Josh. My pleasure. Have a great day, Don. Thank you. All right. All right, everyone, that is all we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed that conversation with John. He is an absolute legend in the whitetail world and a fountain of knowledge. Like we mentioned in the episode, he'll be joining us for our tethered teaching train event that we're co-hosting on Saturday, August 27th at our Hebron, Ohio location. We'd love to see you guys there. As always, we appreciate you listening. Please give us a rating and share this episode with a friend. And until next time, enjoy the pursuit.